Good morning. I invite you to stand if you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. From everlasting to everlasting. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the heart, O God, my God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. With true hearts, let us confess together that we, through sinful thoughts, careless words, and loveless deeds, have transgressed God's righteous law and deserve his punishment now and eternally. Almighty God, merciful Father, we acknowledge our sinful nature and repent of our sins in thought, word, and deed. For the sake of Jesus, grant us forgiveness so that as your redeemed people, we may be fit places for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and may serve you in time and eternity. In the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. O oh God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort through Jesus. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson appointed for this festival of Pentecost, Genesis chapter 11. There we read, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. We join together in the psalm found on page 7, the choir singing the verses and the congregation singing the refrain where indicated.
Our second lesson is the account of Pentecost, which Luke records for us in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel on record in John chapter 14, also our sermon text this morning. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for the hymn of the day.
In the name of the triune God, my dear Christian believers, my Christian friends, knock, knock, who's there? I'm sure all of us here are familiar with knock, knock jokes. They've been around for years. Do you have a sense of humor? Would you like one? Yes, I believe God's, one of God's gifts to our world, an important gift, is the sense of humor to be used in the right time and the right place. And knock-knock jokes are just one way to express that. Admittedly, some knock-knock jokes are very corny, but others are quite clever. The real humor of knock-knock jokes are the elements of surprise and the unexpected. I mean, the first answer to the question, knock, knock, who's there, is usually just given a simple name. Upon further requests for information or identification, that name is used in an entirely different way than one would expect. It's absolutely no joke. But today is the day of Pentecost, not just in our church, but across the world. And we celebrate how the Holy Spirit knock knocks on each of our hearts every time we hear a Bible truth expressed in a sermon, in a personal Bible reading, or in a Bible class, or through the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. Yes, when we hear the knock knock of the Holy Spirit, we ask who's there, and well, the Holy Spirit, we know him, But what exactly he's done for us, that's a different case. There seems to be a lot of confusion, even among many religions today, on who the Holy Spirit is and what he's done for us. What I mean is this. Some churches tend to overemphasize the Spirit's work, and some tend to underemphasize it. Some churches, like the Pentecostals or the Assembly of God, They say you don't really have the Holy Spirit unless you can speak in tongues, do miracles of healing, or really feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's a false understanding. The Bible never says you have to have that. On the other hand, other religions like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, they rob the Spirit of his power, saying he's really not God. We know where that comes from. It comes from Satan himself. Oh, what sows of doubt and confusion that Satan loves to sow. But to the faithful Bible reader, that's you and me. The Holy Spirit certainly is no mystery. Whether you studied about the Holy Spirit years ago in catechism classes or in Bible information classes, we learn from Holy Scripture how time and time again, how the Spirit has revealed himself to us. Already in the Old Testament, in the second verse of the Bible, the Bible says in the book of Genesis how the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. He was right there at creation. Just a few verses later, God speaks and says, let us make man in our image, using the plural pronoun to show there's more than one person of the triune God. But enough about that. We'll talk about the triune God more later next week on Trinity Sunday. But also, in the book of Psalms, King David loved to talk about the Holy Spirit, and quite honestly, we do too. In our offertory, we ask that God does not take his Holy Spirit from us. But in the New Testament, we meet the Holy Spirit too. Pastor Maddock read for you Acts chapter 2, how the Spirit appeared in a big way, but that's not his only appearance. In fact, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave us our mission and how we're going to carry that mission out to go into all the world baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit knock-knocks on your heart, you and I would do well to listen. We just need to listen up to the third person of the triune God. So why should our hearts be open when the Holy Spirit knocks? Well, in our sermon reading from John's Gospel today, we're going to learn that the Holy Spirit has three gifts for us, gifts we can really use, 
gifts we truly need. So on this festival of Pentecost, let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide our study, to fill us with more faith, and to lead us to see what these three gifts are. They're first of all the gift of Jesus' words, secondly the gift of saving faith, and finally the gift of real peace. The first gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of Jesus' words. And at first glance, we might ask ourselves, do we really need more words? Think about how our world is literally filled with words. I just think of all the words that we've already heard today. Maybe you turn down the TV, the radio, on, your, on the internet. How many words are out there? And it almost seems like there's too much noise, too many words. Earlier this spring, I was able to take my family for a couple of days to Washington, D.C., and one of my favorite places to visit is the Library of Congress. Have you ever been there? Quite an impressive place. The Library of Congress contains every new book that is published is sent there. Just think how many books there are, how many words there are in that place. In fact, every year I'm told that it adds more books that are totally in the Waukesha Public Library, and there are a lot of books there. Think of the millions of words, the billions of words, literally trillions of words that fill that place on shelves, on microfiche, and even on computer hard drive space. But think about the content of many of these words. Empty words, meaningless words, and what I mean is this, all these words don't seem to solve the many problems that we have in our lives. The problems of needing peace in our world are bringing us close together. Can it really be true that we need more words from the Holy Spirit? Jesus in our sermon reading today says absolutely yes. Listen to him as he explains. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching, literally his words. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So here's the point, my friends. We don't just need more words. We need the right words. We need Jesus' words. We need his words applying to our lives every single day. His words of truthfulness, his words of comfort, his words of forgiveness, his meaningful words. Now to the Pharisees who thought they were too good, they sure didn't need Jesus' words applying to them. Jesus had a warning. He said, he who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is because you do not belong to God. Jesus laid it on the line. He was telling them and us, yes, we need Jesus' words today. There's a dangerous trend in our world among, among both young or old to think, you know, I don't need Jesus' words. I'm just fine. Sure, the Bible is important, people say, for somebody else. Oftentimes, the Bible and the church are dismissed as being too old, too formal, too out of touch. You know who's behind that, right? Satan is trying to separate us from God's word. People today are really claiming to love God without loving his word. But in our reading today, Jesus says that's just not possible. He says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. The meaning of Jesus' words here is unmistakable. We need the gift that the Holy Spirit brings to us right now, the gift of Jesus' words. Now consider this. Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus ascended into heaven. He withdrew his visible presence with us, but he left his word with us, his word to save us, his word to guide us. In fact, Jesus had this to say about his word. In Mark chapter 13, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So to keep that promise, Jesus sends you and he sends me the Holy Spirit, and here's what the Holy Spirit has done. 
He has inspired the writers of every page of Holy Scripture. He has inspired the writers to write down his words on scrolls, on paper, on Kindles, on websites, and yes, even on our smartphones. Holy men of God spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus reminds us that the Holy Spirit still delivers all that to you and me. He says that, the, that, that he will send the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, who will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Yes, Jesus is teaching you and me right now. He's teaching us about how he delivers the words of God from heaven to earth, from God to us. You know, when you think about it, great religious leaders may speak decrees, but they're not necessarily the words of Jesus. People who speak in tongues, it may seem quite impressive, but they may not necessarily be the words of Jesus. And what comes to us, what we think up to our of what we think of by ourselves are not necessarily the words of Jesus. On the other hand, when the Holy speak, Spirit speaks to us in the Bible, we have the words of Jesus, and that's a big deal. You see, this gift of the Holy Spirit of Jesus' words has not only been given to us, it's been given to the whole world. In all time and all places, the Bible is still the world's bestseller and most popular book. The American Bible Society did a recent survey and they said that it's still the most popular book and there's an average of four Bibles in every American home. The Bible has been translated in more than 1,600 languages. That's amazing. But also this following stat may surprise you. The American Bible Society found that the Bible is found in two out of three non-Christian homes in America. That surprised me. It surprised me because just having the Word of God doesn't always mean that people understand the words of Jesus. Think about this. How easy it is for us to ignore what the Bible has to say. I mean, isn't that a lot like having a brand new birthday present all wrapped up with the bows still on, sitting on your kitchen table, but never opening it? Why would anybody do that? But how easy it is for Satan to fill us with so many things to do, we just don't take the time to open it and unleash the Holy Spirit's power to our hearts and that we need the most. You know, the Holy Spirit hands people his word, the Bible. And most people say thanks, but, you know, I'll read it when I have more time. You know, when I get older, when I get done with school, oh, when finally I get married, oh, when the baby gets a little bit older, oh, when I'm not up north, when I don't have to run the kids to music class or to sports program, when I retire, my friends, how easy it is for us to rationalize our need for the Holy Spirit, our need for God's word. Oh, you and I need to pray this morning. Father, forgive me, for we often don't know what we are doing with Jesus' words. I pray that it's obvious that you know if you, if you can benefit from the first gift of the Holy Spirit, you're going to need the second. Knock, knock, who's there? The Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit who? Who not only gives us the gift of Jesus' words, but also gives us the saving faith to believe it. Even though saving faith is placed on the inside of our hearts, it comes to us from the outside. And you and I can't produce that power on our own. The work of conversion, that's solely the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, none of us here can talk ourselves into believing in Jesus on our own. It's a gift that means I can't decide to believe in Jesus on my own, nor claim any credit for faith. No one can. Martin Luther had an interesting view of faith that was more humble, more honest, and more scriptural. In his explanation to the third article that you and I are going to confess at the end of this service, this is how he had to describe what the Holy Spirit does for us. He says, I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me 
by the gospel. You know, this truth really hits home when we're reminded how we are in this world, physically alive, but without the Holy Spirit and without Jesus, we're spiritually dead, blind, and enemies of God. That's why St. Paul had to remind us, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit bring us saving faith? Simple. When we're brought to baptism, just like water washes away dirt in baptism, he washes us all of our sins away. And he connects us to Christ. He makes us his believers. And you know why that's important? Because that's certainty to know it's not what I have to do. It's what the Holy Spirit has done for me. Believe it. Knock, knock, who's there? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who? Who gives us the gift of saving faith. But finally, there's one more gift the Holy Spirit gives. It almost seems so obvious that we don't even need to talk about it. But since Jesus concluded our sermon reading this day, let's read it. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. What is this third gift of the Holy Spirit? It's peace, real peace. Oh, it's not the kind of peace that a puny political candidate will try to promise us this political season. It's not a peace here on earth. It's a far more important peace that the Holy Spirit brings It's a peace that passes all human understanding. It's a peace of knowing that your sins and my sins, even though they deserve eternal death, were forgiven in full because Jesus died for us and was raised again. So by the Spirit's power, believe it. And when you and I believe what Jesus has, that peace with God, you and I can't help but saying, thank you, God. Thank you by the way I live my life. So with the Holy Spirit's power, live it. And this gift of peace really has fantastic power. The Holy Spirit gives us real power not to lie, not to be lazy, not to hurt, not to curse, not to lust, not to be greedy, not to show favoritism. Instead, the Holy Spirit gives us his peace, his peace which empowers us to pray, to love, to worship, to live, to be patient, to share, to overcome trouble, not on our own, but with his help, and finally, to die in peace. So on this festival of Pentecost, let's say it one more time. Knock, knock, who's there? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who? The Holy Spirit who gives us Jesus' words, saving faith, and real peace. At the beginning of my sermon, I asked you, Do you have a sense of humor? You can see that if you can smile, well, can you? Well, you and I can smile today in this service. Notice I didn't tell you a joke. Instead, we can smile because the Holy Spirit has touched our hearts. My friends, may we take that sense of joy that we have, not only here, but to the world. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Having heard God's word, will you join me in confessing what's at the bottom of page 9? We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Although not written by the apostles of the first century, it expresses the faith brought to the nations as the Holy Spirit enlarged the church. Today we confess the third article of the Apostles' Creed which testifies to the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and speak together the section of Luther's small catechism that explains it. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, Believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. 
and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. I've just been asked to share a few announcements with you today. First of all, I'd like to read to you a letter from Mrs. Sarah Cowlitz. She was called as one of our teachers at Trinity Lutheran School, and she's accepted the call. This is her letter. Dear members of Trinity, on April 17th, the voters of your congregation extended a divine call to me to serve as the extended learning teacher and to teach upper grade math and English. Over the past few weeks, I've had the opportunity to speak with several teachers, leaders, and members of your church, and the information they shared with me was invaluable as I deliberated the call. Thank you for keeping my family and me in your prayers during this process. After prayerful consideration, the Lord has led me to accept the call to serve as your teacher. I look forward to returning to serve at Trinity once again. I pray that my experience as a special ed aide in the public school at Waterloo and Stone Bank will aid me in my work at Trinity. Thank you once again for all your prayers and encouragement. God's blessings on the remainder of the school year. Sarah Cowlitz, we look forward to welcoming Sarah next fall. Tonight, our stewardship committee uh, wants to invite you to a very special workshop. It's uh, called a Christian Living Seminar presented by one of the counselors at Wisconsin Lutheran Child and Family Service entitled Through the Lens of Gratitude. All, all are invited. It starts at 6.30 tonight. It'll take place down in the, tr in the fellowship hall. Also, the Board of Trustees and Stewardship Committee are arranging or organizing a work day on Saturday, May 21st. That's next week from 9 o'clock till noon. We're looking for volunteers to help beautify the interior of our church as well as the exterior. There's no need to sign up in advance for this event. That simply show up in work clothes. Everyone is invited to help. You're invited to save the date for our Vacation Bible School coming this summer. We're trying a brand new format this summer. Instead of every day, we're doing it on several Friday nights, June 17th and 24th. But we're still in need of not only students, but also people to help. If you'd like to help or sign up, simply go to the church's website at trinitywells.com. There's a link there. Or you can call the church office. Uh, Laura Reinke, our coordinator, would appreciate the help. And finally, a reminder that there is a free will offering today to help support our high school members who are participating in this summer WISCO mission trip. Those are the announcements. Please take a moment with the friendship registers as the ushers gather our gifts of love. Thank you.
I invite you to stand for the prayer of the church and the liturgy that follows. O Lord, our God, you have raised us from our hopelessness through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give to us your spirit as you have promised that we may remain in the saving faith and faithfully accomplish your purposes in our lives. O Lord, our God, heal the sick, comfort the troubled, console the grieving, and give your peace to the dying, that everyone who cries to you in their need may know the full consolation of your love, sustaining them in their afflictions and sorrows until you deliver them all to everlasting light and life. O Lord, our God, meet us now in your mysterious and real presence in the blessed supper that is before us, that we and all who commune today may be fed and nourished to everlasting life. Finally, O Lord our God, we pray not as we ought, but as we are able, delivering to you the burdens of this mortal life and the cares of our hearts, with confidence and trust that Christ has done all things well and will give to us all things needful and beneficial. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day poured out his promised Holy Spirit to testify to the truth and to remind his followers of everything he had said to them. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for all you have done for your people in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost and for the growth of the church under the Spirit's guidance. Accept our praise, Lord, and grant that all who partake of Christ's holy body and blood this day may be filled with your heavenly peace and joy. As our advocate and comforter, May the Spirit keep us sanctified in body, soul, and spirit. And finally, may we be granted our places with all your saints in glory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may stand. Almighty God, the gracious giver of all blessings, we thank you for having fed us with the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, assuring us thereby that we are truly members of his body, the Church. Sanctify us by the working of your Holy Spirit that we may continue in this fellowship and do the good works you desire us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the same Spirit be all honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing the closing hymn.